Good evening, everyone. Um, as the curator of the lecture series, Making Sense of the Digital Society, and on behalf of the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society, and the Federal Agency for Civic Education, I have the pleasure to welcome you to this evening's lecture with our esteemed guest, Rasmus Gleis Nielsen. Rasmus and I first met at a conference in Prague in November 2016, in the wake of the US elections and their surprising result back then. And just a few months after the Brexit vote and its surprising result. In the aftermath of these vo votes, in the heated processes of sense-making, how could that happen? Social media platforms and their assumed inherent tendency to spread rumors, to foster fragmentation and polarization, were quickly found guilty in public and policy discourse. In these heated debates, debates there were few people who balanced the high public and policy demand for sense-making, the quicker and easier the better, with the complex and complicated nature of research into these issues. And who balanced this better than Rasmus? In blog posts and Twitter threads, in EU high-level commissions and in public events, he has regular, regularly contributed evidence and explanations beyond the easy rhetorics of fake news and bubbles, fake filter bubbles since. Now today, only four days after another election demanding explanation, we are so happy to have you, Rasmus, for the final lecture in our series this year. Addressing the big questions, the key questions of the digital transformation with rigorous research. That's what we thrive for with this lecture series. Almost exactly two years ago, we started this series with Manuel Castells and have hosted 15 lectures since. And we will be continuing the series into the next year. It is such a privilege for being able to invite the most, most interesting and brilliant academics of the continent to address the thorny questions of our time. I especially thank our cooperation partner, the Federal Agency for Civic Education, for making this possible, and the theater, Howe, for providing this wonderful location. So at least I, for one, am looking forward to another set of brilliant speakers and pressing issues next year. But now I'm looking forward to listen to your lecture, Rasmus. And now I hand over to Tobi Müller, the moderator of the lecture series, to properly introduce our guest. Thank you all for coming. Not much introducing to be having to be done by me, I guess, after this. You already get a, quite a clear picture of our, our renowned guest tonight. How do we access media? Have you heard the news today? On social media, where else, of course, on platforms that then refer us to the news site or some form of it, sometimes there's still a shadow of blue in the margins, maybe. Maybe the typeface in the header looks familiar. Or if your phone is old and slow, like mine, until a week ago, you saw it blink just for a second. Twitter analytics, Facebook analytics. That doesn't happen with my new phone anymore. I don't know what happened there. Maybe it's just too fast. So I do both. Access, as probably all of you, access news by referring or search, but also directly to websites I check irregularly on a daily basis. Maybe I'm old school, having been an editor at newspapers in the art section, you know, it's in the very far back of the paper, or way down below the last native ads, if you scroll down. But the benefits in terms of reach are, even to me, also very clear to see in the platform economy. So let me start with a little bit more of a personal note here. A couple of months ago, I wrote an article that compared Greta Thunberg with the singer Billie Eilish, saying these extraordinary teenagers were heralds of a paradigm shift in pop music. Both are rather moody and timid at times. What most normal teenagers are, in fact, but teen pop stars had never been allowed to be that, and almost all teen stars had been sexualized, most of them outrightly oversexed, but not Thunberg nor Eilish. I had fun writing it, but did not think that much of it. It was just another text, you know, on the brink of uh, cultural analysis and pop music. Then it got, all of a sudden, about half a million views and almost 800 comments on the news site. This is not even what you would call going viral. It's far from it. However, compared to the average reach print articles in the art section usually have, or in my case had, this, of course, was equal to a landslide. Half a million readers in the art section never ever. Important for the last 150,000 views or so was an aggregator called Pocket that uh, promoted the text under the search engine embedded in Firefox, for example, you know, the browser. 
Pocket, in turn, is sensitive to movement on Twitter, or just word of mouth, but what is a digital word of mouth, actually? So people told me afterwards, you know, mostly people who knew by rumor, who have heard something. Basically, I still do not know exactly what happened or how it happened and who made how much money off it. Only thing I know for certain, it wasn't me. This was an attempt to broadly introduce you to tonight's topic, the power of platforms and how media uh, adapt to it on a more personal, less scientific note. Science, of course, is the turf of our guests tonight, communication science. Today, he is the director of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at the University of Oxford and a professor of political communication and editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Press Politics. Danish by birth, he studied political theory in Copenhagen and Essex. At Columbia University, he got his PhD in communications. In his own words, from his rich and helpful blog, I really recommend to you, I quote, most of my research deals with A, news media organizations and their ongoing transformations, B, changing forms of digital media used in political and news-related contexts, and C, political communication and campaign practices. The latter, campaign practices, is the subject of his first monograph, Ground Wars, Personalized Communication and Political Campaign, Campaigns, plural, at Princeton University Press, which won him the Doris Graeber Award given by the American Political Science Association to the best book published in political communication in the last 10 years. His Twitter wall is also an excellent way of getting uh, to know him in a bit more detail. No animal content, though, as far as I could check. So or I should say a good way of getting to know his work and what he deems worthy of our attention. Did you know, for one thing, that the talk of the filter bubble does not really hold up to research anymore? Because contrary to fears of filter bubbles, we find that reliance on various social media and search engines, in fact, drive people to more and more diverse sources of news through incidental exposure and automated serendipity. Did you also know that by now only a th one third of users go directly to the publisher's sites to access news? Did you also know that I'm not making this up, but I'm still quoting from his Twitter wall? Speaking of which, we have a Twitter wall tonight. There's the hashtag uh, Digital Society. There you can um, ask questions during the talk, during this introduction, during the conversation. We're going to have one-on-one -on -one for maybe 20 minutes after his talk that are going to be, some of them are going to be read out to you in the audience. There's also two microphones, as always, um, here in the venue uh, for your questions to be taken and answered, I hope. So should you have the impression that this is going to be a Facebook live feed after all this talk about platforms, you are mistaken. Please welcome now, in the flesh, flown in from far and farther away England, Rasmus Kleis Nielsen. Welcome. I'm not going to lie, I could sit there and listen to myself be introduced like that all night. Um, but I suppose I have to sing for my supper. I want to say just two things by way of introduction. Um, I uh, run something called the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at the University of Oxford in my daily job. And I think there are sort of two, maybe two things to, uh, to know about the personal and professional uh, side of that job that, that I want to preface this with a jump in. Our mission as the Institute is to explore the future of journalism worldwide. Um, and my personal connection to that is quite different from most of the people I work with in the sense that I've never been a journalist myself. Um, my formative experience of journalism is I was the kind of kid who would leave the school in my village to walk home during the lunch break and read the local paper, which arrived uh, just before noon, and then walk back to school to have my evening classes. Uh, but my first professional encounter with news uh, was not writing. I was a newspaper delivery boy uh, in the morning in Denmark, which I can tell you in the winter is rather cold and wet uh, and sometimes quite snowy. And later on, I sold newspapers via phone, telemarketing, um, which I sometimes tell my colleagues these experiences from the 90s may mean I have a somewhat less rosy view of print journalism than some of the people who did the writing that I sold and distributed. Um, the professional thing I think you should know before I dive into this is that the Reuters Institute is part of the University of Oxford, but we work with a wide range of different 
partners and funders, which include both media organizations like the BBC and many others, as well as media regulators like Ofcom in the UK, but also technology companies uh, like Google. Uh, and I say that because I think we live in a world where there are many different complex interests at play and sometimes there are conflicts of interest that may be real or perceived. And I wanted to be clear uh, the, who we work with and what our mission is uh, before I jump into this talk. So each of you can think about that when you listen to the argument that I will present to you uh, tonight. So what is that argument? What I will talk about tonight is the power of platforms uh, and about how publishers are adapting to that and what that might tell us about what kind of societies we live in today and where they might be heading in the future and what your role uh, is in that future or could be in that future if you should decide. So by platform companies, uh, I mean companies like Google, uh, Amazon, uh, Facebook, and Apple. So large technology companies that have delivered and maintained digital platforms that enable interactions between at least two different kinds of actors, normally us as individual end users, and then a number of third parties that normally include at least advertisers and third party developers and marketers, but in the case of these consumer facing platforms, also you include publishers like newspapers, broadcasters, and digital porn uh, organizations that present their content via these intermediaries to us as end users. So in the process of running uh, these uh, digital platforms, the companies come to host public information, they organize access to it, they create new formats for it, and they control data about it. And thereby, they influence the incentives around investment in public communication, political communication, but also specifically news production, which I'll talk about today. Now, before I launch into talking about uh, the, the case that I want to work through with you uh, tonight, I think it's worth recognizing that even as most of us see each of these companies in isolation as powerful behemoths that sort of loom large uh, over many parts of our digital existence, and indeed they are large behemoths that loom large over many parts of our digital uh, experience and lives, they are also at the same time faced with each other in what then Google CEO Eric Smith in 2011 in a, I think a quite a revealing moment called the platform wars. These companies I think we need to remember are engaged in what we could see as probably the largest stake corporate battle in human history in that many of the dynamics of the online environment are winner takes most dynamics at a global scale. So the winner takes most takes a lot indeed. And these companies increasingly are competing with each other in many, many different areas, even as each of them also dominate a particular set of the digital economy and our digital lives. So if we want to think about the rise of platforms, uh, and in particular their relationship with publishers, um, I think I need, we need to really start with us. Journalism exists in the context of its audience, uh, the political significance of journalism, its social importance, the sustainability of the business of news, the legitimacy of arrangements like public service media depend on a connection between publishers and members of the public. And increasingly, uh, the platforms are the companies that serve as that intermediary and control the access to us, the public, the online audience. As uh, Toby uh, alluded to in his introduction, uh, this year, when we surveyed online news users in 38 markets across the world and asked people amongst the many different ways in which they say that they find and access news online, which one is their main way of accessing news online, only 29% identify going direct to the apps or websites of news publishers. And more than two-thirds identify various forms of site door access, like search engines, social media, mobile alerts, aggregators, and emails. So in 2019, we already now live in a world in which, if we look just at the ones that are rely on various forms of algorithmic curation, namely search, social, and aggregators, more than half rely on various forms of algorithmic selection, and less than half rely primarily on editorial curation by professionals. These are choices that we make individually and in the aggregate as members of the public. And I'd bet my bottom dollar that if I had tracking software installed on your phones, I would find that many of you too engage 
uh, uh, probably willingly, probably uh, with some uh, uh, enjoyment of the convenience, the ease of access and the many affordances in these very practices. So we are the ones, if you will, that are driving a fundamental shift in the relationship that publishers have with us as the public, namely a move from a world in which almost all of us, when we got professionally produced news, got it by going directly to the channel controlled by the content provider, to a world in which the content still comes from professional providers, but the channels increasingly are controlled by digital intermediaries, by the platform companies, largely operating for profit and out of the United States. And because we, individually and in the aggregate as members of the, uh, of the online audience and of the public, choose to spend our time in this way and rely on these companies, as a consequence, we're spending a large part of our time with them, and the advertisers that historically funded journalism, uh, not because they cared about journalism, but because they cared about our attention, are now following us to where our attention is going, namely to the platform companies. So by now, uh, two companies alone, Google and Facebook, account for a very large share of the global market of online di digital advertising, more than half, in fact, um, and of the top 10 sellers of digital advertising, there are nine platform companies and one media and telecommunication company, Verizon, not a single publisher. We are choosing platforms and the advertisers who were never interested in news, never interested in journalism, only interested in our attention and selling things to us are following us to the platforms. And the collateral damage in this development is the traditional business of news that was heavily reliant um, on subsidies from advertisers, the cost that we paid at the point of consumption, free for broadcast and limited for print, did not bear the full cost of producing the news that we relied on. This money is now going elsewhere because we are going elsewhere. And publishers are left to deal with these relatively new entrants that have become so powerful in such a relatively short span of time in the grander scheme of things. So how do we think uh, of the power of platforms? I think there are sort of two things we need to think about here. One is uh, what is the nature of this power and the second one is how it's exercised. So before I turn to the question of how that power sort of works in practice, I think it's worth recognizing a few things about the power of platforms. Um, the first is, as with any form of power, there is no neutral way to exercise it. Power is the capacity to make a difference and differences make a difference. It is not easy to be neutral, and there is no point that will be accepted by everyone as one of perfect neutrality if you are a very powerful actor. I think we can all think of examples like that. The state, for example, courts. You might be impartial. You might exercise your power in ways that ensure accountability, intelligibility. You might exercise your power in ways which we find legitimate or individually might even find just, but there is no fully neutral way to exercise great power. Power makes a difference. The two further things about the nature of this power I think is worth highlighting is, um, first, I think that the power of platforms is relational. It is powered by, if you will, uh, us as billions of end users. We make platforms powerful. It's also powered by the millions of third parties, advertisers, developers, marketers, but also publishers, who engage with the platforms and serve up things that we as end users find and engage with. So power here is very relational, and I think this is a crucial point in, in stark contrast to the industrial behemoths of the 20th century. Platform companies control not the means of production, but the means of connection. This is a relational form of power that's quite different from possessed forms of power. Furthermore, I think we should recognize, and I say this not as sort of a, an unalloyed positive thing, but just as a feature, a descriptive feature of this power, is that the power of platforms is highly generative. It enables things that would be hard or sometimes even impossible without them. So you could say, for example, that the development of the internet, of the World Wide Web, has made uh, information available but it's the emergence of successful platform companies that has made that information accessible and actionable. Think about how many billions of websites there are. Think about how many billions of people are online and think about how much easier search and social media and messaging application makes it to communicate with or access information or act upon information or engage with information. So this is the generative nature of platforms. I'm not saying this is an unalloyed good in itself, but I think it's important to recognize if we want to understand how this power works. 
So, what kind of plat uh, power does platforms then exercise? What is the practical workings uh, of this power? Well, I mean, I think there are some forms of power here that we know very well from uh, a, you know, a century or more of social science research. Platform companies, when they are successful, of course, parenthetically, we should recognize most of them fail, but the ones that succeed grow very large. Uh, they exercise forms of power that many large organizations exercise. They exercise hard power, they have direct influence, they have money to spend, they engage in lobbying, they can lean uh, on, on entities like any other large and powerful organization. They have hard power. They also have, though perhaps somewhat diminished with critical public scrutiny in recent years, at least for some of the individual companies, forms a soft power, if you will, power that is not about directly influencing people uh, and making them do things they wouldn't have done otherwise, but is about attracting people and entities, co-opting people and making them work with you, soft forms of power uh, that, again, many other organizations exercise too. Publishers, for example, have hard power and soft power too. Uh, I would venture to suggest that both we as members of the public but also politicians treat, for example, a newspaper with greater deference than we would a similar sized furniture company. So newspapers too and publishers too have uh, soft power. But platforms also, I would argue, have something that is more distinct. And I will call this platform power and I will run through sort of five aspects uh, that I think characterize this form of power and the way in which it's exercised, which I think is distinct to the kind of companies that I'm talking about tonight. First of all, uh, platforms have the power to set standards on the digital platforms that they create and control. They set both technical standards and social standards, community standards, terms of service and the like. And they can set these in ways that reward or penalize certain kinds of behavior in ways that they will say serve their end users and thus their business model, but of course will have consequences for different actors who are on the platforms. This is just one example from Google as the largest of the uh, consumer-facing uh, platform companies, uh, not always as large as Microsoft or Apple, but in terms of reach with the public, arguably the largest of these companies, and is the policy called first click free and the way in which Google Search for a long time essentially required publishers who wanted to be indexed to make the content available for the first click, even for non-subscribers, even if they had a paywall. Now, for publishers, this seemed quite interventionist and not particularly welcome. Google would say that this was a case in which Google had made an exemption to publishers to actually give them benefits that were not afforded to anyone else because this one ex was an exemption from Google's general what's called anti-cloaking policy that you cannot show different things to the search engine bot from what you serve to users. But publishers felt this was a company in California dictating their terms of trade with their end users. So it's an example of how a company can set standards and if you're a third party, take it or leave it. These are the terms. Secondly, platforms exercise their platform power by making or breaking connections. So um, a company like Google, several uh, hundreds of times every year, will update the algorithms to power the search results, for example, that each of you have probably relied on several times today for various things in your life of great or, or lesser importance. And again, um, as the company, in particular in the early years, would often recognize, it's become slightly more guarded than its rhetoric uh, recently, it would often recognize that there are no neutral ways of doing these things. When you change uh, automated standards and algorithms, there are winners and losers. And sometimes uh, the winners are sites that others see as quality and sometimes they're not. This is just one example from the so-called Panda update. Um, which was a change that privileged original reporting and penalized mm -hmm. sites that reused content originally produced and published by others. This was marginally increasing the search traffic to quite a lot of established publishers and had a dramatic negative effect on the search traffic to so-called content farms like Demand Media, a company that briefly was worth more than the New York Times, but after Google introduced the Panda, update essentially imploded on the New York Stock Exchange. So very clear power, and one in this case that actually helped established publishers marginally, even as others, of course, felt the negative impact of the change. These connections that the platforms make uh, rely on automated action at scale, 
This is a fully uh, uh, automated process. Um, it will make uh, probabilistic decisions on the basis of a range of signals, including personal data collected from each of us as individual users. This, of course, is the only way in which a company like Google can present, you know, 164 million results for a search query of automated action at scale in less than a second, right? This is the only way in which this is possible, and this is distinct from other forms of power that we have known in the past. The ability to do these things is something new and something distinct in our societies. And of course, it works not only for us as end users searching for something, it also works for the people who want to reach us. So there's automated action at scale at the advertising end too of the people who want to reach us, right? So this is just a, an interface of what the ad serving uh, interface looks like if I wanted to buy ads trying to reach you through Google search. Fourth, the platforms uh, have a power of, we can crudely call it secrecy or sort of opacity, if you will. They try to sort of explain a little bit about how search works. This is a very in nice infographic from Google of how search works. So it's all crystal clear, right? A split second before you search, they index over uh, X number of pages, and then they've spent over one million something, and then as you search, and they're ranking the result, and it's all crystal clear, isn't it? Right. Now, of course, there are, there are, there are self-interested and more principled reasons for why they have secrecy. The self-interested ones are quite clear. These are commercial companies. This is how they make their money. Like most other private companies, they want to protect their IP. This is sort of quite, you may not like it, but it's quite reasonable, if you will. The slightly more principled one that they will often trot out, but I don't think it's always disingenuous, even though it is self-interested, is to say, well, you know, if this process was entirely transparent, who would benefit the most from that transparency? Us, as end users? or the various bad actors that we have seen time and again in recent years try to influence our elections, corrupt the public uh, reputation of individuals or companies or the like. So who would really benefit from that transparency? This is a question the companies are fond of asking. Finally, in the fifth aspect, um, we should recognize that platform power often operates across domains, right? This is just a small subset of the different products uh, and services offered by Google. Uh, and of course, many of these power each other across. So data collected through Gmail may uh, power advertising and search results that in turn may inform uh, uh, display decisions on YouTube that in turn may reform, and on and on it goes. Like these things can cross subsidize each other at the back end, often through data, but also through other resources. So these companies will have a tendency to sort of spread, if you will, quite sensibly again, but often in ways that can be quite sort of challenging for those around them. So these are the five aspects of platform power um, that I have uh, highlighted. The power to set standards, the power to make or break connections, the power of automated action at scale, power of secrecy, and power that operates across domains. Now, if large platform companies like uh, Google and Facebook, but also smaller ones, of course, Twitter, Snapchat, increasingly Chinese-owned uh, ones like TikTok uh, and others coming out of mainland China, if they have this type of power, exercise this type of power, what do they want from publishers? Why would they care about publishers? Well, I would suggest to you that they uh, care about publishers because, as I said at the outset, that platform power is relational. We power them, but third parties power them as well. So what do platforms want from publishers? They want access to content, Journalists would prefer the term journalism or, or perhaps news, but content is the term of art in the industry. They want the ability to rely on automation, right? They don't want to make human curated decisions about every display decision. That's too expensive for their business model, which relies on making a high profit margin on very low value, large number of transactions. They want the opportunity to collect data and they want control over the user experience and the product. What do they offer in return for this? You might ask, uh, if you were a publisher, why would you allow access to these companies to your content? We should remember that for search, for example, it's trivially easy for a webmaster to prevent the indexing of a website from Google search, for example. That's just inserting one line of HTML, of robot exclusion protocol, done. This is a choice you can make. So why don't they do it? Well, what are the platforms office publishers? And here I think it's interesting to go back um, because I think it's been quite clear for some time what they offer. This is a quote from Eric Smith, the then Google CEO, uh, more than 10 years ago. We've decided, the locution itself is interesting, we've decided that the value we provide to the partners is the traffic. 
We get access to content, you get access to audiences. Where does that leave the publishers? Well, around the same time and as part of the same debate that Smith uh, offered this observation in, Rupert Murdoch, the executive uh, chairman of News Corp, uh, one of the more vocal critics of the platform company, has said, we have entered an epochal debate over the value of content. So, how have publishers responded in this epochal debate over the value of content, which I think they're right to say that we are in? Well, um, first of all, I think we should recognize they haven't all reacted the same. Um, so there are sort of three basic types of responses, if you will. You can say some publishers uh, try to collaborate with the platforms. The CEO of one major UK-based publisher says this can be win-win in interviews conducted by Sarah Ann Gander from Simon Fraser University in Canada and myself uh, as part of our research. Uh, but for the vast majority of publishers that we interviewed for this research, where we spoke to more than 50 different editorial and uh, commercial leaders and news organizations in different countries, uh, collaboration is not really an option because there's not necessarily anyone at the platform companies who have the time to talk to you. And the observation is this, rather dryly made by the editor of a regional newspaper in Germany that shall remain nameless since we promised the interviewees anonymity. We need Facebook. Facebook does not need us. So this is coexistence. They are there, we are here, and we just have to sort of find our way in this world. And we have no direct relationship with them really. Then finally, um, of course, we have confrontation. And this is uh, language, uh, the colorful language of Rupert Murdoch, uh, who has, ironically, one might say, on another platform, Twitter, often called the bigger platform companies like Facebook and Google content kleptomaniacs, thieves, and a number of other colorful things. How do these responses inform the day-to-day decision-making in the publishing organizations that most of us rely on for our news? Well, again, there is not one response. I think we can sort of think of a range of different strategies, if you will, for the ways in which news organizations engage with the platforms. There are those um, on the left who pursue what we can call an on-site strategy. Their primary purpose when they engage with the platforms is to take you and your attention from one of the platforms and then use the products and services offered by that platform, whether it's Facebook or Google or Twitter or something else entirely, to lead them to lead you to the app or website of the publisher themselves, on site. That's where they want you. And from, from their point of view, the platforms are marketing channels, nothing more. This is what they want. The other strategy uh, we might think of as off-site. This is the strategy uh, with Media Part, the French digital-born news organization in the Times of London, the legacy newspaper in, in the UK, are examples of on-site strategy. The Guardian, as another legacy newspaper, or BuzzFeed, as a digital-born organization, might be examples of publishers who pursued an off-site strategy who would say, well, we need to be where the audience is. And if the audience is off-site, if the audience is on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, we need to be there. And then once we are there and have their attention, we will find ways of monetizing that to support our editorial ambitions. Right? We will seek them where they are. We will not build them, they will come, we will seek them where they are. I think it's really important to underline that these choices matter. The choices that publishers matter, make they matter. They make a difference in terms of the results that we see. We track this in a very granular fashion. I'll just quickly show you some data from the UK where we passively tracked with people's consent the clicks of a representative sample of UK online news users for a month to see what news they used, and because we can see each URL, we can see what they clicked on before they clicked on a news story, so if they go from Facebook to the BBC or from Google Search to The Guardian, we have a reasonable inference that they arrived at the news story from either social or search. How does that break down from different publishers? Well, I'll just highlight a few here. The BBC, by far the most widely used source of online news in the UK, more than 80% of its traffic came direct directly to it, and less than 20% was reliant on platforms sending traffic to the BBC. Similarly, Sky News, more than 60% direct traffic. The, the Daily Mail, a mid-market uh, newspaper, popular newspaper, more than 50% direct traffic. So, you know, 
getting 20 or 30 percent of the Daily Mail's traffic from search or social, that's a lot of traffic, but the majority came direct. Then there are other sides that are in a very, very different position. If you look at the Sun, a tabloid newspaper akin to Bilt, at the bottom, at the time, the Sun got less than 20 percent of its traffic direct highly, highly reliant on search and social. They were seeking the audience where it was. Similarly, The Independent, uh, now only online, but at the time also a print title, again, very limited direct traffic, highly, highly reliant on search and social. But these are very different, very, very substantially different results from different strategies. Now, of course, the relationships that publishers have with the platform companies by now have grown well beyond just the question um, of audience reach of our attention. Increasingly, um, the platform companies, in large part because they compete for attracting not only us, but also the publishers who enrich the platforms, have developed a wide range of different products where the publishers are the customers, are using products and services provided by the companies that they also uh, make uh, their content available to. So to track this, um, we did a study after GDPR was introduced where we just tracked what are the third-party elements and cookies that load when you load major news sites. And we looked at more than 200 major news sites across the EU after GDPR was introduced, what loads before you click any consent buttons. And what we find, of course, is that the platforms by now are totally intertwined with the websites of most major publishers. So after GDPR was introduced in July last year, we found that 96% of major news sites, of more than 200 major news sites across the European Union, contain third-party content from Google, from different parts of Google. 70% contain third-party content from Facebook. 57% contain third-party content from Anderson. All of these choices are made by publishers themselves to integrate things from Facebook, like the Facebook ad pixel, from Google, like Google Analytics, or various Google advertising services. These are choices publishers make to rely on the technology and infrastructure provided by the platform companies. It's about uh, support for subscriptions. It's about a variety of different uh, tools provided by um, the platforms. Now, from the point of view of publishers, this might seem per perplexing, right? You know, we've just seen that Rupert Murdoch more than 10 years ago said we have an epochal debate over the value of content. He's very concerned about the influence and growth of these platform companies. And yet we can see that his son, for example, with a U, not an O, his son, relies heavily on search and social. We can see that most publishers integrate lots of different tools from these companies that they also compete with for attention and advertising. So why is this? I think this is an interesting puzzle. So here are some components to an answer. What are these relations like in practice? Well, drawing on the interviews we did with editors and executives from news organizations um, across the world, here are four observations about what the relations are like in practice from the point of view of publishers. First, there is a tension between the operational and the strategic. Short term, the benefits that come with collaborating with the platforms are obvious. It gives you greater audience reach. This audience reach is valuable from an editorial point of view. You want to reach the public to make a difference, to spread the word about your journalism. It has commercial value. It generates advertising. It generates opportunities for selling subscriptions and many other commercially valuable things. There are very clear short-term operational reasons to collaborate with the platforms. They offer up very real opportunities. Now, of course, there is a tension between that and then a longer-term strategic worry about essentially as many people would say, sort of build your house on somebody else's ground. Every publisher we interviewed full well know that what the algorithm gives, the algorithm can take away. Right? They all know all the different examples that we have come across of demand media or Upworthy or others suffering from changes of this or that algorithm from that or this or that platform. And knowing this, they go in because the incentives are clear. They go in with open eyes, taking on the platform risk in return for the platform reward. Now, the decision is informed by something I think we can recognize at an individual level, which is the fear of missing out, right? A lot of this discussion in industry circles is influenced by sort of coverage in the trade press where prominent CEOs or editors from different publishers will appear and talk very glowingly about the results they've achieved from working with one platform company or another. 
And then our interviewees would tell us literally that what they get is they'll get an email at 1 a.m. in the morning from their CEO saying, what is our Snapchat strategy? Or what is our TikTok strategy? Or what are we doing on Instagram? So the fear of missing out when there is a sense that there is proof of concept from other publishers is driving a lot of these decisions. Then, of course, it's actually hard to evaluate whether uh, publishers are getting a return on their investment because of the secrecy that I described before. A lot of the metrics that are released are quite limited. A lot of the data is not very granular. It can be quite hard for the publisher to assess are they actually getting the return that they expect from their investments in working with the platforms. And yet there they are, because of the fear of missing out, because of the short-term objectives, they are there collaborating as we speak. Finally, our interviewees, of course, would say that these are very asymmetrical relationships. The platforms are very big. Most publishers, by comparison, are very small. And all of news combined in most countries is only something like 3% of the time we spend online. So even if 3% of Google's business or Facebook's business is, adds up to quite a bit, the weight of any one individual publisher in that relationship is limited, if you will. So what do publishers want from these platforms if these are the practical aspects of their relationship? Well, they want audience reach, they want the opportunity to convert, and they want brand recognition. Uh, as Toby suggested again, they want you to remember who produced the news, even if you found it through Facebook or through Google search or on YouTube and the like. Now, they would like more than that. They would like more editorial control uh, over whether you remember the brand. They would like more data. They would like more opportunities for monetization. But ultimately, this will do. Audience reach, opportunity to convert, and brand recognition. Why do we know this will do? Because today, more than 10 years after Rupert Murdoch announced this epochal debate over the value of content, where are we? We are where even the publishers like Axel Springer and like News Corp, who've been the most vocal critics of the platform companies, are collaborating with them every day. And you can go to the website of Built right now, and you can find at the bottom of it, at the end of the site, you can find the links to their social media accounts. You can look through the HTML and see how Built 2 to ensure that their audience, that their journalism reaches an audience is working with search engine optimization. You can see how all of these companies continue to work with the platforms. You can see how they engage when the platforms offer new products and services, uh, like voice assistance that Google is developing, um, or various video formats as Facebook is developing, or uh, chatbots on messaging applications like Facebook Messenger, or, uh, or for perhaps new aggregators uh, when they are launched as well. So more than 10 years after Murdoch uh, announced this debate, we are in a place where the publishers have accepted, essentially, the terms of trade, which are, you give us access to content, we give you access to audiences. Even if they would want more, this is what they're going to get, and this is what they've accepted. So where does that leave us? And this is the last thing uh, I'll uh, talk about before uh, we uh, open up the more conversational uh, part of this. There are really two different ways um, of giving a talk like this, where one tries at the best of one sort of modest ability, or in this case, my modest ability, even though I rely on the work of many others, including great team members from the Institute and elsewhere, where one tries to sort of present an analysis of a big and complex structural change underway in our societies. And if we want to think of sort of past parallels to what we're witnessing now with the rise of platforms, I think at the very least we're talking about something similar to the rise of television, perhaps some would say something similar to the rise of the printing press, and for wider analogies, perhaps something like industrialization uh, or the industrial revolution, something like, of that order, I think, sort of gives us a sense of the magnitude of the structural change that's underway in our public sphere. So there are really two different ways uh, of talking about something like that in a, in a setting like this. Um, you know, one can try, as I've tried tonight, to identify some key features um, and then end with an exclamation point. These are the features, and this is what you should think about them. That's a morality tale, often told in black and white. There is another way, I think, of telling a story like this, which is still to try to identify some key features, as I have tried to do tonight, um, but end with a question mark and not tell you what I think you should think, but ask you what you think of what I've told you. So I will end with a question mark or a set of question marks about the implications and offer them for your consideration. 
I think that the rise of platforms uh, has a set of consequences that have been described, I think, with great penetrating analytic ins analytical insight by Jose van Dijk and her co-authors. I know Jose was one of the speakers in this series in the past, and I'm honored to be in a lineup that includes her. An implication that's about individual empowerment and dependency. All of us as individuals are empowered by the platform companies. That's why we use them. They allow us to do things we would like to do. They make those things easier, more convenient, more compelling, and we use them because they empower us, even as in that process we become more dependent upon them. I shudder at the thought of what would happen if, G, uh, if Google Drive or Gmail uh, shut down tomorrow. I have outsourced much of my life, really, uh, an uncomfortable amount of my life in some ways, to uh, some of these companies. But I do it knowingly. They empower me even as I become more dependent upon them. But what I think we are seeing here and what I've tried to describe tonight is a further step beyond that. Because I think what we are seeing is an institutional equivalent dynamic of empowerment and dependency. Publishers, too, are becoming empowered by and dependent upon platform companies. Publishers, too, like you, or you, or me, engage with the platforms because they allow them to do things they would like to do, knowing all the time that they are also becoming dependent upon them in many ways. They're accepting the platform risk in pursuit of the platform reward. And I think the question essentially is, given that this development, I think, is driven not just by technology, though also technology, but is driven by our individual choices and the aggregate of those choices and the choices of our institutions and our societies, I have seen, for example, even as EU commissioners talked about the evils of political micro-targeting, I've been able to go in and look at the Facebook profiles of the European Commission itself using the same tools, right, that they were, you know, knocking in their speeches, right? There's not just publishers, it's political campaigns, it's interest groups, many others are becoming empowered and dependent on these companies, even as our individual and aggregate choices in, as, as end users and as institutions are producing these things, these choices over time become structures. And I think the question it presents for us is an urgent need for a discussion of platform governance. How do we ensure that our future is not simply driven by the aggregate of individual consumer choices or individual institutional choices, but is subject to some form of discussion, not just of what platforms we have, but also what kinds of platforms do we want in our societies? So that's where I really want to end, is that it's our choices that make the platforms powerful. And no matter the fortunes, the rise and potential fall of any one platform we have right now, the fact that all the major advertisers or sellers of advertising apart from one are platforms suggests that even if some were broken up or for some reason uh, you know, turned belly up tomorrow, other platforms would succeed. So I think we are in a world where the culture and economics and technology underpin the platforms that they are here to stay. So really, the question I want to leave all of you with is, given what you've heard elsewhere, given what you've read, and given what I've said tonight, how do you think we should respond collectively? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rasmus, for this very uh, hands-on uh, presentation, which gives us a lot of food for thought for uh, this one-on-one -on -one conversation now for about 20 minutes, I think, and then um, to open it up for the audience. Let me start with, um, I think, central term in your talk, which I thought to be choice. You started out uh, with the phrase saying, we are choosing platforms and stressing our own individual roles we play actually in empowering uh, the platforms. 
and you um, ended, you know, with the implications that were all sort of, you know, uh, complicit with that. Even publishing, uh, publishing companies are empowering uh, platforms. Even you commissions are empowering platforms. This implicitness or this so-called choice. And um, I am not sure if choice is really the right word. If being implicit, complicit, I'm sorry, if being complicit with the phenomenon is really choice. Let me, or let us maybe think back a little bit to the 90s when the publishers um, try to keep up uh, with, um, you know, with the internet, and they failed. Like the music industry failed 10 years before the publishers. They just failed because they didn't invest enough. I mean, it, you know, it holds up to this day, the pay gap between people working for the online departments of big publishing houses uh, and the ones still working for the print is still huge. I mean, it's ridiculous, actually. But it's still there, 20, 20 years after the fact. So wouldn't you say that many publishers actually made many grave mistakes um, in that process that sort of led to the point where we are now, where you have to say, yes, that they failed. That's why they're dependent on the platforms. Couldn't it have turned out differently, actually? Uh, thanks. I'm, I'm really glad you asked that question because I think that's a, a point I, I sh probably should have dwelled on more to illustrate why that's an important point for me. Um, I think what we will see on closer inspection is that it has turned out differently for those publishers who made different choices. Mm -hmm. And I want to be very, very clear. Mm -hmm. I, I, I am not second-guessing other people's work. This is difficult stuff. Uh, people were doing difficult things in a very uncertain environment under great pressure. So I'm not passing judgment on individuals here or even on companies. But I think it's really, really important to recognize that the choices made by different institutions led to different results. If we don't see that, we arrive at a conclusion of what I would think of as unjustified determinism. And I think unjustified determinism leads to passive acceptance and a surrendering of the uh, ability we have collectively, not individually, but collectively, to change the world we live in. Now, some people think of that as voluntarism. Uh, I think of that as an analysis. There are situations in which choices do not make a difference, sadly. This is not one of them. Mm -hmm. You also talked about you know, the, um, the fight between an operational logic of media, you know, getting the product out on as many platforms as possible, just increasing your reach versus strategic logic. You know, what you talked about at the end, customers move away from home turf to other places not governed or not controlled uh, by the publishing houses. This is a battle on a purely corporate level, so to speak. Do um, you think there's a point where government or state actually can come into play here to ensure something like diversity or independence uh, of media when it comes down? You know, well, it really boils down to who's going to win this fight. And then it is a fight between operational logic and strategic logic that sort of clash in there. I mean, this is a, really the reason why I end with a question mark rather than an exclamation point. I'm happy to share my views on this, but I think it's fundamentally is a question, uh, a classic question of public policy, mm -hmm. um, where I would just hope if, if, if we do one thing collectively tonight, I will hope that every one of you, when you leave this room, think about that question. Uh, what role do you think the state uh, with its advantages and its disadvantages of its ability to intervene in a private marketplace should play in something like this. Um, and, and I'm happy to, I'm not shy about sharing my personal views, but I'm actually more interested in each of you thinking about that and also thinking about how important you feel that is compared uh, to other things you care about when you cast your vote, for example. Um, you know, there are meaningful differences in issues like this. I guess my personal view is that um, uh, I think it's important that in a democratic society where the political class and the government has a demonstrated commitment to free speech and where there are high levels of institutional integrity, so in a country like Germany, but not some of our neighbors within the European Union, sadly, mm -hmm. I think in a society like that, I think the state can play a legitimate and constructive role in structuring a media space in a way that guarantees individuals fundamental rights to re both receive and impart information. I really want to stress that what I'm about to say does not apply to states that do not respect those fundamental rights. But in such states like Germany, I think the state can play a constructive role. It can do it by creating more robust institutions than the market does on its own. 
public service as well as direct and indirect support for private publishers. These policy tools are available if policymakers want to use them. It's very simple. I mean, you can you know, download our latest report that describes them in, with great clarity. So the state can create more robust institutions. The state can also help to create a competitive marketplace um, where there is effective um, competition oversight uh, if there are examples of abuse of dominant position, that those are corrected and acted against, uh, if there are, are structural issues that prevent competition, not just in the market, but for the market, that, for example, access to data is opened up uh, and meaningful oversight is exercised, I think such uh, more, um, uh, shall we say, effective competition enforcement would benefit uh, uh, all, uh, all of us, uh, not always all publishers, because of course competition law is not to protect incumbents, it's to protect competition. Um, but whether the state should pass judgment on the quality or worth, sort of worthwhileness of individual pieces of content, this I am personally quite uncomfortable with. Um, this is a view that some people hold, uh, including some people I respect a lot, uh, Francis Cairncross, um, I should refer to as, as Dame F Francis Cairncross, um, published a report suggesting that uh, uh, something she called a news quality obligation should be imposed upon uh, dominant intermediaries to surface quality content. I suppose the question that I have is, who would get to decide what is quality for me? Um, and would this body that would make this decision be able to determine that in a way that was impartial and that would serve me as well as it serves my nephew who is a plumber and may have different informational needs and desires than me? And would this body be able to exercise that in a way, that power in a way that was seen as legitimate and impartial by the public at large? Or would it be seen as yet another attempt by establishment, you know, conspiracies to fix the system? against uh, outsiders, as we see right now, Donald Trump and many other prominent politicians are attacking the platform companies for allegedly conspiring against them without any evidence, of course. So I'm personally quite uncomfortable with that last kind of intervention, where the state or some organ created by the state gets to determine what is right for each of us to see. But the more structural phenomena, I think we have a number of tools that uh, I personally uh, you know, think can be usefully applied in this situation. I'm glad you mentioned, yes, I'm glad you mentioned some of our neighbors um, here because I think that would be really a tough call to make in the process of time, right? I mean, governments that sort of guarantee free speech and others that are slowly moving towards something that clearly uh, voices more uh, authoritarian uh, fantasies, so to speak. I mean, what's been happening in Poland, for example, is very hard to judge right now. In Hungary, it's much more clear. Right, but in Poland, it's, it will be a tough call. So that's a distinction somebody has to draw before you even can answer that question, so to speak. But that will be really hard. But let's come back to the term of platforms. I mean, you write about that um, in one of your papers. Um, we all know that, of course, too. The platform suggests the term platform suggests openness, uh, you know, neutrality, something like a agora, a public sphere, and so forth. Uh, clearly, that is not really the case anymore with uh, all the big, you know, the big five. Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, and Microsoft, what would be a better term to actually describe platforms from your experience? Um, I mean, I think um, it's a bad habit of social scientists to like sort of conjure needlessly complex $10 words for $2 ideas. <laughs> uh, um, but if I were to conjure a $10 word for a $2 idea, um, then, then I think intermediary is a term that strikes me as more precise. What you use, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I think the battle is over, and, 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 and I would rather use a term that people might be familiar with from everyday language mm -hmm. platform if that's the term that resonates with people. I don't know whether that works in German or, or whether it resonates with you, but in the English language, by now, this is the standard term. And it would be, um, you know, it would be coy to call them intermediaries in English. Uh, I could call, you know, newspapers, um, you know, um, for-profit, you know, publishing operations with a legacy of putting ink on dead trees. Like, I mean, sure, but that would be more precise. But you know, it's kind of distracting from the fundamental point. So I think platforms will do with, when we recognize that the metaphor is not without its limitations. If two-thirds, or probably soon 75% um, 
of news traffic, so to speak, goes, uh, you know, through platforms or comes from platforms, more likely. If they, um, platform builders are, of course, like you wrote at another in another paper, also actors with interests of their own, who engage directly with other actors. I mean, some people would suggest that we call them publishers to yes. increase the accountability of them sure. also. It's a, it would be a political sure. move. What do you think of publisher for platform? I mean, it's actually quite interesting to see how the companies themselves have uh, in sometimes uh, with uh, charming directness and sometimes in unguarded motion uh, moments, um, uh, you know, describe themselves in, in these terms. It's worth sometimes for those with an antiquarian interest to read, for example, the original IPO documents when Google went public, where the company describes itself as, from memory, an advertising, product, technology, and media company all rolled into one. Um, and of course, also on some calls with uh, investors, Sheryl Sandberg has, uh, I think on at least one occasion, referred to Facebook, Facebook as a publisher. Now, I think this is a, an area where um, I would just encourage policymakers and those who are lobbying policymakers to try to think through quite carefully what would follow if we were to legally classify them as such. Which is, if we were in a situation where a company like Facebook or Google could be held legally liable from the moment of publication for anything that appeared anywhere on any of their products and services, not just a notice and takedown system as currently exists, where they are, of course, liable, but not from the moment of publication. Um, what would follow from that? Well, if, for example, a tabloid newspaper publish something potentially libelous, you know, would the platform companies be willing to take the risk that you could sue them in California uh, for very considerable damages for someone else's potentially libelous content? And if they were not willing to take that risk, what would the information look like we were able to access via these platforms? And I think we, I mean, that I think is really quite important to think through I would suggest to you that there are already many forces that are incentivizing the platforms to move in the direction of a much more restrictive approach to what kind of information and activity they allow on their platforms. Some of those forces I think are justified and benign, some of them less so. But I think this particular one I would be quite worried about. Um, there are a lot of things that are potentially legal that if you could sue the platform companies for them the moment they appeared on their products and services, they would simply err on the side of caution and, and a lot of speech would be censored. I don't think there is another word for it, mm -hmm. uh, including a lot of things that I think from a legal point of view are free speech because we should remember, of course, that the fundamental right to free expression is extended to covering things that are shocking, things that are offensive, things that are disturbing, and also statements that may not be true. So what would be, can you give us some um, examples, some concrete examples, what you think would not be justified and would still fall under the act of free speech? Because of course people, as you know, are concerned with hate speech, are concerned with racism, are concerned with, um, I guess, right-wing populism where it takes on an activist approach, so to speak, a terrorist approach even on the left also. I mean, um, let me take an example that may resonate here. Um, uh, this is a lay understanding, so if there are lawyers in the room, please correct me if I'm making mistakes here. As I understand it, um, German law uh, treats um, uh, defamation and insults to foreign heads of state differently um, from other uh, forms of insult and defamation. There was a rather prominent case of this not so long ago. Um, with a comedian, you mean? With a comedian who, who, who made some rather crude jokes about a, a, a gentleman uh, 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 who was uh, thin-skinned uh, in these respects. He's uh, in Turkey, I think. Uh, mm. uh, yes, that mm. could be Turkey. Um, <laughs> and I think you just have to think about what would that have looked like if that thin-skinned gentleman who have rather considerable oh. resources, including legal resources at his disposal, could go after the tech companies. What, how would they deal with things like that? Or, for example, I'm from Denmark originally. Um, for a long time in Denmark, blasphemy was a form of criminal uh, speech. Now, in practice, it was not actually enforced. Uh, but in principle, it was. If we had had the Danish equivalent of a Network Enforcement Act, um, 
a lot of explicit, sort of explicit forms of expression in English, for example, would in principle potentially be criminal. And, and, and the way in which this has not had any actual consequences is that no one in their right mind has tried to prosecute someone for blasphemy for a long time in Denmark. But if you could go after a large company far away over any piece of potential blasphemic expression anywhere on any product or service they have in Denmark, I mean, imagine what content moderation would look like. So again, and I really want to stress, this is just my view, right? And it doesn't matter at all what I think. I'm just a citizen. What's really, really important now is that we are facing an epochal set of decisions that will determine the infrastructure of free expression and the policies and regulations that govern that for the rest of my adult life. We will determine that within the next five to 10 years. And, and everyone needs to think about you know, what you think about that. I may think, you know, maybe I've spent too much time in the US, maybe I think that forms of uncomfortable speech is what the Americans call the shitty price we pay for freedom. Maybe you think something else, but as long as you think it through, then I'm happy. There's been, of course, talk about gatekeepers also, and it's uh, kind of a hard to define term because uh, instinctively a lot of us, when we talk about gatekeepers, we talk about platforms and uh, their um, sheer size that, you know, takes on, you know, monopoly form, uh, unprecedented actually in human history probably, uh, just how extensively we engage with those new monopolies. But then, at the other hand, um, talk about early gatekeepers that have been much more strict in allowing us what to see and not to see. One of those early gatekeepers was the Catholic Church in, uh, in Europe, for one thing. And uh, if you look at it in a really broad historical perspective, big gatekeepers have the tendency to break down uh, at one point because people are fed up and people are not going to do this uh, until another gatekeeper comes up and that might be a reformed church. Um, you know, uh, but I'm just as a speculation into the future, are you think, do you think that platforms are going to lose that power in the near future anytime? Are people going to be fed up with them? although they use them on a daily basis. I mean, that's a complex um, form of engagement and a complex feeling, but it's possible to criticize something you love um, or you engage with on a daily basis. Do you think that's going to happen? Are they going to be too big? Um, I, I think there are a couple of different things going on at the same time. Um, I think the first thing that's worth noting, and again, this may be different in Germany, I haven't seen any original data on this, but. Um, in the United States and the UK, amongst the sort of chattering classes, people like me and, and journalists and others, there is a sort of talk of so-called tech lash, mm -hmm. right? Um, let's just say that that is uh, probably more of a Twitter phenomenon than, than anything that sort of has a broad public basis. Yep. When you look at the annual tracking of the American Consumer Satisfaction Index, you know, American users of platforms like Google are happy and they are, have been sort of unbrokenly happy ever since the uh, ACSI started tracking their consumer satisfaction with Google. They have been unbrokenly happy with YouTube. They've been slightly less happy with Facebook and slightly less, less happy with Facebook after the two last years of pretty difficult public discussion, but broadly happy. A and the amount of time that they spent uh, and the number of people who are active with these have not really declined. So the tech lash, I think, is a political and lead phenomenon and very real and potentially quite dramatic in its consequences. I don't think we should see it as a broad-based sort of public turning against these companies that, that most of us, even if we have more and more reservations about them and more and more understanding of at least some of their operations, are using quite a lot, largely because we sort of broadly feel that they you know, do things for us that we would like to do. Now, that said, um, I think there are sort of two other things that are, uh, that are happening. Uh, one is that um, even as it is clear that the most successful incumbent platform companies have some parts of the digital economy where they are very, very powerful, you know, Google is by far the most successful search engines. Facebook is by far the most social, successful social network. Uh, Amazon by far the most successful e-commerce provider. Even if they have individual areas where they are very dominant, more broadly, there are more and more different parts of our economy and our digital lives that are operated via platforms. So even if some 
individual parts of the platform economy is very dominated by a few companies and incumbents who are hard to dislodge. More broadly, I think we are seeing a more plural platform economy and more competition. Not competition in the sense of, you know, a thousand flowers blooming, but, you know, dozens. And I think that's the, why the, the point about the platform wars is important. Like, you know, if you, if you are one of the third parties or end users looking at one of these companies, they look untouchable. But if you're one of them, you're engaged, as I said at the outset, in the fiercest corporate battle in human history, right? So they don't feel secure, even if they have some bastions that are quite secure, they don't feel secure at all. Uh, so I think there is a lot of competition. And then the third thing I think that's worth saying is that it's very clear that, that whatever the wider public discourse or, or public opinion is on this, that there is a very real political movement right now to intervene in this space. And I would be absolutely shocked if we don't see pretty large-scale intervention in this space in the near to medium-term future. Uh, I think we're going to see some version of... Um, of reform of the framework of, of, of competition enforcement um, and, and perhaps regulation uh, at the very least. Uh, I think th th whether, whether that will lead to more uh, decisive uh, correction, I, I think is a separate question and not one I'm personally convinced is necessarily uh, uh, particularly uh, useful or constructive. Uh, but of course we should also remember, and this is again back to the point about what role each of you think that the state and politicians should play in this, that there is one question about what kind of political intervention you would like to see in this space, and the other one is which one you are likely to see, right? And I think it's just worth remembering, you know, just when you think of political intervention, just think of politicians, right? They are the ones who are gonna make the rules. So the rules are not gonna be any better or any worse than the politicians, and, and you know, you're more blessed here, I think, than for example, I would not personally be particularly comfortable with the thought of the current inhabitant of a certain White House uh, being the one to sort of draw, draft legislation of what should govern free expression mm -hmm. for the next 10 to 20 years. Mm -hmm. Before we open this up real quick, maybe a note on your own uh, research. You've done some wonderful um, work, you know, case studies, more I would call it probably qualitative of work, but it's very hard to do quantitative work in your, fee, uh, in your field. And that's um, partly due to the reason that those corporations don't talk and that they don't give out their data and so forth. Facebook is a lot worse than Google, uh, how I take it at least on my side, in the journalistic side, Facebook doesn't talk uh, to media at all, uh, Google only if it's really, you know, if things are boiling over. Uh, otherwise, they really don't. What's your um, history uh, with those platforms? How do you gather your data to your field of work with those corporations? Operations, which just do not have a culture or history um, of working with other actors on an open uh, basis. It's, it's interesting, um, you, you mentioned that uh, my first book, uh, kindly when you introduced me, which was um, essentially a piece of ethnographic research into political campaigns in the United States where I spent 10 months working alongside the volunteers and the professional campaign staff. And I think in many ways, actually, um, that prepared me quite well for doing this kind of work, which, as said, I've done with a colleague, Sarah Ganter, who's done some of the interviews and, and been instrumental in the project, so I should recognize her and her work as well in this space. But uh, fundamentally, I suppose that um, I think the, the key here really is uh, to make sure that uh, everyone you talk to um, uh, are convinced that your interest is to understand what's going on and that you're not gonna abuse anything they say to try to create a headline uh, or to put them in a worse light than they might recognize as a fair representation of what they are doing. On those terms, I've, I find that, that people are relatively willing to talk. Um, uh, and I've found it uh, quite constructive actually to, to talk to them. Um, now, I think the, the thing that's worth just remembering, um, and I don't say this is a defense of any of them, they're big companies, they can take care of themselves as they've shown time and again, and they're making a lot of money. Uh, so they're not really, you know, what is it, um, Casey Newton, you know, John Herman from the New York Times called, uh, called 2019 the best worst year ever <laughs> for Silicon Valley, right? I mean, they're doing pretty well. Um, but what I would say is that, um, we are in a situation now where the, the sense inside the large platform companies is, I think, basically identical to the sense inside a high-stakes political campaign, which is that 
um, every journalist is out to get you, and anything you say will be used against you. Uh, and there is, they think that there is no sort of journalistic consideration of whether it's actually true, whether it's actually fair, um, you know, whether it's taken out of context or the like. Um, I don't think they're always right, but I can see where they get that from. Uh, I think there is a lot of sort of, uh, you know, coverage right now that is a bit sensationalist, frankly, in this space, uh, with many but notable... that's journalism for you, right? I mean, every company in the world could have that concern. Uh, it's true. I, I think, uh, and I, again, I said, I, I don't think it's particularly unusual. I think it's just that these companies were just as naive as we were about them. I think for a long time they were pretty naive about, you know, the rest of us too, right? Because they've been treated quite nicely by... Uh, publishers, um, by politicians, and by members of the public. And in some sense, we are all growing up. And I think, frankly, I think that's really, really quite healthy for all of us. Also, of course, I should say, because I think as we grow up, all of us, the platforms as well, I think we'll also be better equipped to make meaningful distinctions just as different publishers are different or different politicians are different, different platforms are different. They do their work in different ways. And if people are interested in learning more about that, I can't recommend enough the work of Rebecca McKinnock and the ranking digital rights team that try to really assess each of the platforms on their transparency, on their human rights record, on their privacy policies and the like. So you as a user and a citizen can really understand, okay, well, you know, they may all be based in Silicon Valley and come out of California, but they're kind of different, right? And they're not all the same. Uh, so I think we should be growing up as well. Thank you, Rasmus. I think it's time to take questions from the floor. Maybe a couple first, and then we'll switch to Twitter. There's a lady in the second row, and then a lady in the first row. The gentleman in the second. That's what I saw so far. So let's take those three for the beginning, please. Hi. Thank you so much for your lecture. Um, so you briefly touched on regulatory issues already, and you also mentioned liability. So I'm wondering whether you think um, that liability rules need to be updated, and whether you think the recently updated copyright directive has done anything positive for this sort of picture you've drawn uh, for this battle, the epochal battle um, on the value of content. Thank you. Do you want to take a few, or should I take them individually? Okay. Them. Thanks. Um, just to make sure we get lots of times for different questions, I'll try to be much briefer than I am. I'm unfortunately, have a weakness of just rambling on. Um, on liability, um, I think the most important thing is to ensure more effective uh, oversight um, uh, through a combination of uh, multi-stakeholder uh, oversight um, greater accountability and greater access to data for independent third parties so that no one gets to mark their own homework. I think that's a more important first step than the question of liability. It seems to me that if we knew more about what was going on, we would be better able to access bad performance and good performance and the things in between and be better able to make informed decisions about whether the legal framework for expression and behavior, which I think is a much more sensitive area, needs to be adjusted. So I think we need to understand better first. Now, what I always say whenever the platform companies have the, you know, the, the good uh, manners to you know, at least momentarily look like they might be marginally interested in what I have to say is that I think that if they don't help us understand better what they are doing, we have moved from a world in which many of us thought they were better than they probably were to a world in which many of us may think they are probably, may be worse than they probably are. And if that is the world we live in, then there will be draconian intervention and it will hurt them. So I think it's in their self-interest to be more transparent than they are now. And if they aren't, it may be because they have something to hide and then you know, we'll find other ways of addressing that. Um, on the question of copyright, um, you know, publishers have very strong opinions about this. I think there are a number of concerns with the copyright directive. I'm not uh, very keen on the idea of, uh, of screening content uh, as it's uploaded for potential copyright violations in ways I think will probably restrict expression for us as individuals, so I have reservations about that, and I don't think that can be technically solved in a way that doesn't restrict speech by error on the side of caution, so I have reservations about that. From a business point of view, I understand publishers are fighting their corner. Uh, I respect that. I think people should fight their corner when they're doing things that are important. I'm not personally convinced that the fundamental business challenge facing publishers is copyright. It seems to me the fundamental business challenge facing publishers is that we have moved from a world in which uh, media audiences had low choice, and as a consequence, publishers had high market power over advertisers, 
to a world in which media users have high choice and as a consequence publishers have low market power over advertisers and it's just basic economics that they will make less money than they did in the past. But that's a hell of a lot easier to, for me to say as an outsider than it is to say if you have quarterly profit goals to your shareholders or if you own a company that used to be worth X and is now worth Y. I mean, McClatchy in the United States is worth 99% less than when they bought Knight Ritter. I mean, it's tough for these companies. So I respect they're fighting their corner, but I'm not convinced that the copyright reform in itself will do anything material for their commercial uh, prospects. Jeanette, please. Thank you. Um, you pointed out the link between empowerment and dependency of publishers vis-a-vis uh, -vis platforms. And you also made the point that governments should only get involved in terms of regulating these markets in those countries where fundamental rights are effectively protected. But I wonder if governments do indeed get more involved and regulate these markets, whether we would not see the same kind of link emerging between empowerment and dependency. Think of the BBC in the UK, for example, which is much more dependent on the government and it shows in its reporting. I mean, I, I think you strike uh, strike it on the head. I mean, I, I think that's the concern. I mean, and I, you know, I'm very firmly of the view that in democratic societies, uh, the public benefits from a wide variety of different media arrangements, but I would, as much as I admire the BBC, nothing is perfect, but it's real shortcomings. I personally admire the BBC, and I think it's unbalanced. My personal view is that it's probably unbalanced, a good thing that the BBC exists. But, you know, would I want to live in a world where there is only the BBC? No, I wouldn't. I mean, uh, I think it's good that there is a diversity of different voices. And I would be, you know, quite worried about a world in which the, 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 the majority of the platform economy was directly subservient to the state. That doesn't mean that there isn't a role, as some have suggested, for some form of public service platform. Though I think we need to be very clear-eyed about what that would mean for your tax bill, right? Because to compete with these very large and very successful and very rich companies is not cheap. Uh, you know, Tencent in China has just committed two billion US dollars to compete with TikTok, right? As an upstart, a relatively small upstart platform company. So if there is to be a public service platform funded by all of us to compete with the Americans, it's not going to be cheap. Uh, and it might be the right thing to do, but, you know, we're not going to get it uh, for cheap. Um, <clears throat> yes, good evening. Um, you know, I never thought that I in my life would defend or look positively back to the years of where Axel Springer or Murdoch were dominating the, the media landscape in our countries. But one has to say, he, they didn't put loudspeakers, microphones in our living rooms. They didn't know when we would switch off and on the lights in our apartments. They wouldn't create payment systems, uh, control access to social or credit ratings, uh, uh, dominate e-commerce. I think that the, the platforms we are talking about is not just about media, it, it is just so overwhelming in its, its power and its outreach into various uh, uh, areas of the economics which, which makes it uh, uh, really very difficult to, to accept this as a status quo. It's, it's not just that they have replaced publishing in one way or the other. It, it, I think it, it goes far beyond that. I mean, uh, it's clear that, that the largest of these companies are growing you know, very rapidly in many different lines of business. And I think this is one of the reasons why it's important that we think about what does a competitive economy look like, a competitive digital economy look like, where you don't punish success and you don't uh, think that companies are bad simply because they are big without evidence, but where, if the burden of evidence can be lifted to document abuse of dominant market position, then that has to have consequences, and ideally consequences quickly, not consequences 10 years later, where it's too, too late to really make much of a difference. That said, I mean, I think, uh, and I'm not saying this is what you're suggesting, but I think it's worth sometimes recognizing that um, I think sometimes when we maybe lose sight size of how large or small these entities are. So for example, um, there, are, there are, I hear, and again, I'm not imputing this view to you, but I hear people say all the time, oh, you know, these are the largest, most powerful entities ever to see this, this plan and whatnot. And I'm thinking, well, you know, and they have more resources than anybody else and whatnot. I mean, I hear this in Brussels all the time, for example. Well, one thing I like to think, just remind people of when the commission and people, officials from the commission say these things is that the budget of the European Commission is much larger than the annual revenues of Facebook. I mean, 
and the and the I mean the budget of most European states is far larger than the annual revenues of any of these companies. So these are not the first large agglomerations of power we've seen in our societies. I think the question is, can that power be exercised in a way that is accountable, that is intelligible, that is legitimate, and that allows for contestation? That that for me as a citizen are the key concerns, and I don't think I have the answers. Uh, but I think we need to develop them, and I would like to think that it would be better if we develop them on the base of some kind of evidence rather than the sort of uh, assertions and opinions that tend to dominate a lot of the elite discussion that I, uh, that I see, at least from policymakers and, and some journalists, not all, but some. <laughs> Plus, it probably would be hard to uh, say that Axel Springer and Rupert Murdoch did not peep into any bedrooms, uh, you know, during their reign when they were in power. I mean, maybe not in all of our bedrooms, but in very many. So um, let's look at, you know, if anything's happening on Twitter before I have another gentleman who raised his hand. But Jana, is there anything on Twitter worth noting? Maybe we'll take just a bunch of questions now and then uh, see what happens from Twitter. There's one question. Okay. <laughs> By uh, Christian Humburg, shout outs go out to you. Uh, he has a question about your opinion on sponsored posts on news sites. What do you think about them? Um, look, the business of news is very difficult and very challenging. Um, And I think it's really legitimate that publishers think about any source of revenue that can support uh, independent professional journalism, provided it doesn't undercut the purpose of that independent professional journalism. And I think sponsored content can do that if it's done well, if it's clearly marked as separate from editorial, if it's clearly presented in a way where the reader can understand this is not the same as the... Uh, news coverage or independent commentary and opinion in this newspaper, then I think it's one of the sources of revenues that publishers can rely on. I have to say, I see a lot of publishers do this in ways that strike me as quite short-sighted, where I think they risk their credibility, which I think long-term is their most important asset, their brand and their credibility. Um, and I understand why they're doing that, because fundamentally, of course, this is what the sponsors probably want, <laughs> is, is to blur the line between editorial and sponsored content. So, you know, I see some publishers do it well, and I respect that, because I, I like publishers to make money so that they can invest in journalism. I don't really care about their shareholders and whatnot, but journalism I care about. Um, but I think there are a number of publishers who risk uh, their, their relationship with the audience, because I think they're doing it in ways that are a bit um, uh, potentially misleading. Thanks. There's a gentleman in the, in the back, third to last row. Yeah, please. Um, thanks a lot. Um, my question goes more in the direction of business. Um, so um, we covered a little bit the music uh, domain. Um, let's make an example of Spotify. Um, how, uh, how would you rate um, business opportunities amongst that um, to, to centralize, for example, subscriptions um, where Spotify makes actually 90% of the revenue via subscriptions and give a substantial amount of that to uh, and distributing uh, amongst the music industry? Uh, how would you rate that um, as a business opportunity, for example, for publishers? Uh, there are a lot of smart people who are trying to create some rough you know, counterparts to Spotify or Netflix uh, for, for news right now. Uh, the other type uh, of uh, sort of new platform, if I can use that term, that, that a lot of people are, are experimenting with the various forms of micropayment systems, again, shared across different publishers. So you'd have a single interface through which you could pay a small amount of money for individual articles from lots of different publishers without having to subscribe to all of them individually. Um, it seems to me... I wish these people well. I really do. As said, I, I really, you know, fundamentally want to see commercial innovation to power editorial ambition in the publishing industry. I firmly believe in the importance of for-profit independent professional journalism. Um, that said, I think the, the question I have in my mind is, uh, is whether the analogy to Spotify or Netflix is a good one. And what I mean by that is that there, it seems to me that there are two things that are very, very different between music and videos on the one side and premium video on the one side and then news on the other side. Um, one is that the, the unit we engage with is, uh, mu is more substantial, much more substantial in the form of, of television drama or, or let alone movies, but even with songs. Um, 
that's one thing, right? I mean, the, the engaged time, to use industry jargon, that, that I have with, say, a song from, from the Hamilton musical is longer than almost any news article I will read in the course of a day. And, and that is a key driver of the value of a platform that aggregates that content from lots of different providers. The other thing is the shelf life of it again. You know, I will listen to that song from Hamilton, you know, dozens of times. Whereas by its very nature, a lot of news content has almost no shelf life. It's, it's, it has almost no value for the user a day or two after it's been published. So it, 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 I wonder whether models that are developed for large units of evergreen content will work for tons of very small units with very short shelf life. We have somebody in the back with the microphone already, please. Yes, can you hear me? Uh, thank you. This is a very interesting, um, great presentation. Uh, my question is that given that many stakeholders, um, as you mentioned, from elected officials to publishers, advertisers, and even us as consumers of content, have a vested, if not um, problematic, kind of interest in maintaining the power of platforms, who are you looking to as kind of maybe exciting either leaders, initiatives, or organizations that are really um, pushing for reforms? Well, I mean, let me first let me be sort of frank with you, and in this format sort of invites almost uh, you know indecent sharing um, in the intimacy of a theater with a few of one's best friends. Um, I hope I have conveyed that I think the current situation is is complex and that it has some very real problems associated with it. Uh, I would also say that my personal view is that I wouldn't trade the media environment we have today for the one I grew up with in the 90s, warts and all. I don't want to go back to the past, even though I think the present is quite complicated and fraught with some possible dangers. I can see why newspaper owners would want to go back to the past, but, but I don't. I can even see a journalist. I mean, that, that was quite privileged, but I said that was not my job. My job was to you know, wade through the snow and deliver the paper or try to sell it over the phone to people who really didn't want to buy it. Oh, no, it's only owners who want to go. Uh, it's not journalists, believe me. So, so I, I don't think the 90s were, were better in some immeasurable sense. Uh, that said, I think there is room for improvement. So what would I like to see? Um, I mean, I want to be realistic about, you know, what we can expect from our politicians. I don't think that policymaking in this area will be any more um, sort of ideal and informed and pitch, sort of picture perfect than policymaking in any other area, uh, really, of, of great stakes, because there are great stakes here. That said, I think we are at a moment now where there is an opportunity to do something in this space. And I guess I'm cautiously optimistic that it might be possible for the new European Commission and for member state governments to think about some interventions in this space that would make this information environment that I think is better than the 90s, even better, if you will, for all of us. So I think there is a space for political intervention um, if we keep an eye on them and ensure that they don't see it as their job to protect incumbents or to act on the basis of moral panics that often, of course, are uh, curiously politically expedient for themselves, right? I mean, there is nothing better for a politician than an unsolvable problem that they can bang on about. We know quite a few of those. Um, so I think there is a space for political uh, action. I think more importantly, and this is closer, I suppose, to the heart of what, what I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, given where I work, I'm actually quite encouraged by the journey that publishers are on. Um, not, not in the sense of the industry being out of the woods commercially, I think there is going to be at least another 10 years of commercial decline in the top line revenues probably for most, for, for most publishers. Um, but I would say that I think there is a newfound clarity amongst publishers about their relationship with these companies where more and more publishers that I speak to I think have come to the realization that just as an ecosystem, very large creatures and much smaller creatures can coexist. So too in media environments, very large companies and much smaller companies can coexist and they can have mutually beneficial, even if deeply asymmetrical relations, as long as they know what they want. 
And I think this is what has become clearer amongst publishers, and that I think is quite encouraging. Similarly, of course, I would hope that all of us, as citizens, if we follow this debate, you know, feel we are making more informed decisions and feel that there is an intrinsic value to living a life that is examined, where even if you're doing the same thing you did the day before, it's better if you do it while knowing what it means, right? T think of the Snowden revelations. We all know now for a fact that we've been spied on industrial scale wholesale by our own governments, right? We all know this now, and it's better that we know it, even if it didn't change anything we did. It has intrinsic value that we know it. So in this sense, I think a more intelligible society in itself is better. And I think we're all, the fact that all of you are showing out tonight is in that sense, I think, encouraging. And I hope that all of you will talk to some of your friends, not about me, that I'm boring, but about these issues, because it matters for all of us. This is almost a closing statement, yeah. But I'd like to take one more question I saw from the audience and then uh, wrap it up because there's snacks and there's a bar open. There's going to be a little buffet. That's hard to tell me now. Let's take the gentleman at the back at the console. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but the end would be the sustainability of freelance journalism, yes, but by taxing platforms. Um, okay, so here's my response. And again, you know, people have different views on this. I think there is a... There is a question always in public policy about what is the most efficient way of doing something and what is the most credible way of doing something. And I think in a perfect world, we look for both things at the same time. Um, we may live in a world right now where the most credible way to make a collectively binding public policy decision to take money from someone and give it to journalism, where the most credible way to do that is crudely put a Google tax. Um, but it's not the most efficient way of doing it. I mean, economists and, and finance ministry officials hate what they call hypothecated taxes. They think they're inefficient, they think to distort the marketplace, they don't think it's a good form of public policy. And I think on reflection, I think we can all recognize why. Imagine a world in which we had a funded uh, public transport by taxing uh, private railroad companies. And then when trucks arrived, we would still need public transport, but we had less money for it. Or where we had uh, funded um, uh, public schools by a tax on uh, coal-powered power plants, and then we would change to sustainable energy, and we would still need schools, but we would have less money for it. So I personally think that the, the idea of taxing specifically one set of companies to provide funding for something we think of as a public good is not an efficient way to do it. I personally think that if we uh, resort to that, which is something I'm a cautiously a backer of, I think there are examples of how this can be done in a good way. I think it should, the money should come through general taxation. And again, I think there is an element of learned helplessness from some politicians and policymakers in this space where they sometimes pretend that they can't do these things right now. Let's give me, let me give you an example from the UK. Um, the UK, under the previous, the Theresa May government uh, announced the introduction of a digital services tax uh, on some of the large platform companies uh, that I think from memory was estimated to be bringing in, I think from memory, 250, um, uh, 250 million uh, UK pounds additional every year of tax revenue. That's a lot of money for you and I. From the point of view of the UK Treasury, that would take the net UK Treasury tax take from 740 billion pounds to 740.25 billion pounds, right? The, the problem here is not money. The, the question is whether we, what we wanna spend it on. And the problem here, I think, fundamentally, is that for those like you and I who think that there is a possible role for public policy to support the economic sustainability of independent professional journalism in a way that doesn't give politicians or civil servants opportunities to meddle with the content, for those like you and I who believe that that is a legitimate proposition, I think the question essentially is one of politics. We've just had an election in the UK. I have to say, if I was a politician, as much as I care about journalism personally, if I was a politician, I'm not sure I would want to go knock on doors and say to people, my campaign slogan, my campaign slogan is fewer nurses and more journalists or higher taxes and more journalists, right? I think fundamentally that's the question, right? 
And, and in that sense, there is a much broader issue here that is perhaps interlinked with the rise of platforms, but not directly reducible to it, which is the public connection between journalism and much of the public is frankly fraying, right? People don't trust journalism, many people at least. Uh, people don't find journalism very valuable. We asked in our big survey this year uh, whether people felt that news helped them understand the world. 51% said yes. Like, like almost half the public doesn't feel that news helped them understand the world. That's astonishing to me. And when we look at the amount of time that people spend with news, it's about 3% of their digital media use. Like the public connection that powers journalism is fraying. And if that public connection isn't there, the profession will matter less, the business will be harder, they will have less leverage with platforms, and it will be harder to make the case for public support. So that is a concern that goes well beyond platforms. But for that, you will have to invite me back to Berlin another time. As a very last note, um, Rasmus now, our second speaker in the series was Christoph Neuberger, then Munich, I think he's now at the Weizenbaum Institute here in Berlin, um, a colleague of yours, so to speak, and you mentioned it too in your writings, you mentioned it uh, partly tonight, that there um, is a difference between what are you know called news corporations and public broadcasts, for example, in terms of political clout, in terms of trust, which they enjoy from their audiences as well. As I am informed, the BBC and um, you know, uh, programs like Deutschland Radio or Deutschland Funk here in Germany actually enjoy more trust than they had like 10 or 20 years ago. So this is actually a graph going up. I'm not sure if it, that is exactly the case with the BBC, but it is the case in Germany that much I know, which surprised me too, in a way, you know, that everybody is talking about the crisis of uh, trust of, of, of the whole journalist, uh, journalism, but in Western Europe with public broadcasting, which is totally different from the US. And it's totally different from uh, Eastern European market as well. Let's not speak about the Russian market. Uh, um, it's sort of a um, you know, very special situation. And it shows in one of your graphs also, where you said that 80% of the traffic goes to the BBC directly. Is this just a mere coincidence or is it ca actually causally linked somehow that trust and direct traffic to the site uh, have something to do? with each other. And is that such a special European situation as I, you know, would like to imagine it? Um, in, in those countries, which we really need to remember are few, in Northwestern Europe, where there are what you can describe as genuinely independent public service media, mm -hmm. um, uh, they are almost always both the most widely used and the most widely trusted, not just most trusted, but most widely trusted, most trusted by different groups in society, mm -hmm. different ages, Important different point. income levels, different levels of education, different political point of view, even on the right, as well as on the left, uh, and in the center in most countries. So that model, um, I think, has something going for it. And also, of course, in the countries where they have not been um, politically constrained from engaging uh, with the platforms, they are often actually quite popular on YouTube, on Facebook, and on Twitter, and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to me that the challenge that's facing public service media in Europe, leaving aside the ones where the challenge is very simple, it's politicians who want to reduce public service media to state broadcasters, which is a much more primal threat yeah. um, than anything else we've, we've talked about tonight, and one that afflicts about one in five of our European Union fellow citizens. We should just remember about 90 million people in the European Union live in countries with significant problems of, of, of press freedom, 90 million. Um, it, the, the, the challenge is essentially that public service media are largely still public service broadcasters, which means that the audience they reach is old very old and aging. And the question, I think, over time is, um, if you have a funding model like in the UK that is premised on everybody paying 150 pounds a year for something, if you're 25 and don't have kids, so you don't appreciate the advertising-free environment that the BBC offers to <laughs> children, and you have only the most fleeting contact with BBC through a news app, mm -hmm you might quite reasonably ask, why the hell should I pay 150 pounds a year for this? That essentially is a subsidy scheme that takes money from everybody and gives it to old people who watch TV. That's a regressive form of taxation. And I think the problem is probably even more pronounced in Germany, uh, to be perfectly honest. Uh, 
where uh, our data at least suggests that with a few exceptions, uh, a lot of the public service broadcasters are really struggling to reach beyond their core broadcast audience. So I say that as someone who believes in the purpose and the potential of public service media also in the 21st century, but the real challenge there it seems to me is not, if you will, um, uh, so much um, trust and reach, which they have, it is uh, whether they can define their purpose and deliver on it uh, for a younger audience who will never, let's be real about this, who will never accept that, the, that, that their media decisions should be made by you know, old white guys sitting in a broadcast center somewhere far away deciding what they should watch and when. I mean, it's, it's impossible to imagine for me that people who have grown up with, with on-demand, personalized, portable, uh, uh, high-quality content will suddenly think, you know what? I think that I should find a man in his early 60s, you know, in Bonn, who can probably better tell me what I should watch than I can do it myself. It's inconceivable to me. And if public service media can't find their, their, their way in this world, it's game over. So in that sense, I, let me just say, I, I think there are some who are, who are trying to look at this. Kai Knifke, who just took over in, uh, what is it called, uh, in Stuttgart, the uh, S, SWR, is that what it's called? SVR. Um, I think he's, he's very seriously thinking about this, and he was, I think, quite bravely went out and said very early on, I'm going to cut broadcast investment to invest in digital. Um, that, it seems to me, is something that they will have to do. Otherwise, they face a bigger threat than declining trust, irrelevance. Well, maybe you have to differentiate the radio here from TV. I mean, TV is a lot worse than that. Um, not a lot of old white guys at the radio stations I work for, to tell you the truth. Uh, that's changing, at least in Berlin. I hope it is, and that it will continue. Very last question. Do you listen to the radio? Are you an old guy or a young guy? I haven't... Um, I can't... Apart from, like, World Cup football, I can't remember the last time I watched something that was programmed or listened to something that was programmed. I mean, all, all my media use is digital. Uh, almost all of it is on demand. Uh, I will very occasionally read something in print over the weekend, just not to stare at a screen. Um, but other than that, um, you know, I may be middle-aged, uh, but I, I cannot imagine uh, going back to, to a schedule. It, it just, it's unimaginable to me, and I, and I really cannot imagine... Uh, you know, a 25-year-old uh, thinking that, you know, we should kill some trees in Finland, you know, pulp them, sail them to Germany, like, print things on them, like, drive them with trucks, you know, to my house and give me things that happened in the world 24 hours ago. I cannot imagine. <laughs> or, or, or the broadcast equivalent. Did I, I say I just, that really? No, no, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm saying this, I, I mean, I, I'm glad that there are some people who find this somewhat humorous, but, but I, I cannot stress enough how often I'm asked by, by otherwise, you know, sober, seemingly sober oh. uh, and sensible people, well, you know, don't you think when they grow up, <laughs> they'll be <laughs> like... They're going to read the paper, huh? Yeah, they're going to read the paper mm. or they're going to watch TV or they're going to listen to radio. And I just have to say, no, I, I don't think they will, actually, to be perfectly honest. And it's not just something I think. This is like, there are copious, there are mountains of evidence to suggest that they won't. So I, I think we, we may not, you know, the generalized we of being sort of published in journalism, we may not like this, but if we don't face it, like we don't have situational awareness, and this is back to the point I've tried to make throughout the evening, just the same way that I want you to have situational awareness so you can make better decisions, not the decisions I might have made in your situation, but the decisions you want to make, but more informed. The same way, I cannot live with the sort of denial the sort sure. of media change denial that exists in some political circles and some media circles. I think we should be realists and confront the world we're in and also just accept that we have big challenges here. But frankly, I mean, so did the generation before us. They had big challenges and the one before us too. And if they could rise to that challenge, I'm sure we can too. So thank you for this very real performance, Rasmus Klein and Nils Kleissen, neither on paper, near on the screen. Thank you for being with us. Rasmus Kleissen, thank you. Thank you.